Hello and welcome to the National Security Conversation. 50 years ago on this day, the 16th of December 1971, Pakistani armed forces surrendered to the Indian armed forces in Dhaka and an independent Bangladesh was born. The event is etched in the collective consciousness of Indians and Bangladeshis and has shaped the relationship between the two neighbors ever since. But what appears as a foregone conclusion today was an unfolding present full of possibilities, unrealized possibilities in the run-up to December 1971. Events in the run-up to December 1971 exposed the deep running differences between the then West and East Pakistan in terms of language, socio-economic reality structures, approach towards religious minorities and foreign policy. Salman Rushdie once described Pakistan as that country divided into wings a thousand miles apart, that fantastic bird of a place, two wings without a body, sundered by the land mass of its greatest foe, joined by nothing but God. Events of 1971 proved that religion alone cannot be the basis of nationhood and in the process undermine the two nation theory central to the idea and creation of Pakistan. Today, Bangladesh at 50 has higher per capita GDP than Pakistan. It is ahead of Pakistan in key socioeconomic indicators of health, education, and standard of living. In some indicators, it even outperforms India. Bangladesh is the new superstar of South Asia. At the golden jubilee of its liberation through a war, let us revisit the events of 1971, how they unfolded, to discuss the political, military, diplomatic, and humanitarian aspects of the Bangladesh Liberation War, I have with me an eminent panel of guests. Ambassador Chandrasekhar Das Gupta, who is here to join us today, is a retired Indian diplomat and a scholar who recently authored a superb book on India and the Bangladesh Liberation War. Lieutenant General Vijay Oberoi is the former Vice Chief of Army Staff of the Indian Army and is currently the President of the War Wounded Foundation in New Delhi. Ambassador Ahmed Tariq, Tariq Karim from Bangladesh served as Bangladesh's High Commissioner to India, um, apart from holding several other responsibilities. So welcome to the National Security Conversation, Ambassador Karim Andas Gupta and General Oberoi. Um, Ambassador Karim, let me begin with you. Congratulations on the 50th uh, anniversary of the Victory Day. Uh, what are your thoughts on this special day for your country? Thank you, Dr. Jacob. Uh, thank you for inviting me to the show. And it's a privilege for me to be on board this with my old friend, Dr. Chandrasekhar Das Gupta, and also with General Oberai here now. What are my thoughts? They are very mixed. One of joy, one of illusion, one of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of, of possibilities that still lie ahead. Uh, uh, thoughts about how it's a miracle that how we are here 50 years after hmm. and, and how we manage that. For us, this is a you know, uh, I've been in, I lived in India for so many years and I, I've always seen this celebrated in India as essentially a Indo-Pakistan centric occasion. Right, right. Okay, and it was, I think, five or six years ago that I pointed out on another show to Barkadat that in Bangladesh, it's very much a Bangladeshi story assisted by India. So, you know, that is, that is where, uh, in a sense, that war between India and Pakistan would never have occurred if there had been no problems between what was then East Pakistan and West Pakistan. But the formation of Pakistan itself was an abnormality in the modern Westphalian political uh, history. Uh, and, and the beginnings of 1971 uh, were perhaps foretold, I would take it even further back than uh, my good friend uh, Dr. Uh, Ambassador Dash Gupta has. I will take it out to the seeds of uncertainty that seized Muslim minds in 1940 and earlier. Uh, 
you know, if the, the if the Lahore Conference of 1940 is taken as the point where the two nation mm -hmm. theory was actually uh, put on paper and pe uh, pe uh, pen, then if you go through the transcripts and the records of that, you will see how very clearly divided the Muslims were amongst themselves. They all wanted independence, but they had different end goals and tactics and strategies to get that independence. And the two most powerful leaders of Bengal at the time were Fazlul Haq and Sarwardi. Mm -hmm. uh, and Sarwardi was uh, a persona non grata in the Muslim League of that time. He was not invited to the conference. He more or less gate crashed. And when he gate crashed, he basically said, look, we want independence. But whatever form of independence we come at, Bengal must reserve the right of forming commonwealths of association with all the other independent states that, that, that emerge after, about it. And That's he right. was talking of Bengal as a united Bengal. Right. Okay, that is something that fell by the wayside by the time 47 occurred. And so in a sense, 71 is the culmination of a process that starts there. The six-point plan that has been mentioned in this book, how it evolved, has its origins in that speech by Sarwardi. Uh, that's the way I see it. That's right. Uh, and, that's and it is... It is uh, revival of or reimagination of that same principle that Sarwardi evoked over there. Uh, basically, uh, I think Dr. Uh, uh, Ambassador Dash Gupta points out that it was sort of re-invoking a loose confederal style. But if you remember, look at the British plans that they gave. First the Crips uh, mission plan and then the cabinet mission plan. They both basically envisaged a very loose federation closer to a confederation with center only having charge of defense and foreign affairs and everything else with the provinces or with the states. And that is what the six point program actually went back to finally in its final shapes. Uh, and, and that is what Sheikh Mujibur Rahman wanted. Now, you alluded to another thing that, you know, we are doing so well here. I mean, after all, we were very contemptuously written off by uh, Alexis, Alexis Johnson in that infamous remark he passed at the on 6th of December 71, when it was evident that Bangladesh's birth was imminent to, and referred to us as an international basket case to which right. his two bosses two bosses replied, not our basket case. That's okay. right. <laughs> now, from that, we, we, not just we, that rankled with us. All these 50 years, it has rankled with us. I tell you, it rankles with me too. Uh, we have not only completely thrown that overboard, we have come where we are. And the fact that we are doing better today if you go back to the economics of then Pakistan, which emerged after 47, and uh, I think we are having some connectivity problem. I with grew up in that. Sure, sure. Please go yeah, ahead. You, I'm still there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, most of the textile mills of United Pakistan between 47 and 50s, 57, were located in Dhaka. There were seven uh, textile industries they, in Pakistan. They were all in East Pakistan. Jute was the main foreign exchange revenue earner of in United Pakistan. It earned 80% of Pakistan's foreign exchange revenues until the late 50s, early 60s. 80% of what was earned by East Pakistan was reinvested in West Pakistan. That's right. And subsequently, West Pakistan positioned itself to become the textile industry hub. We lost everything. So in a sense, we were seeing British rule being reenacted all over again. And disillusionment set in very, very early on. 
I still remember my, I was just a kid of five, six years old. My father, uncle was taking me to see Mr. Jinnah speak at, at Paltan Maidan in Dhaka when he came here in 48. And the excitement in their eyes when they went, I didn't understand what was happening, but I was happy to go out with them. And I saw, <laughs> I remember the change in expression and faces when we were coming back late in the afternoon. And we were walking back, two, three miles we were walking back. And, and the total about turn in their emotions. Again, I didn't that understand is... what was happening. That I understood many, many years later. Okay. So in a sense, the disillusionment with what had been created, the, the uh, uh, how do you call it, the, the going back on, on, on the concept that on which it had been created, everything fell through there. And so in a sense, that progression took place and led us naturally to 71. But I, I think it's quite a quite a painful experience. And I was looking, I was reading uh, Ambassador Das Gupta's book, and uh, you know how it started from um, the idea of a confederation to where it ended. It was a, it was quite a painful process. I think w the one key takeaway that I have from what you just said, uh, Ambassador, is that India Indian narrative does not do not need to keep uh, India in the center at the center of um, everything that happened. It is Bangladesh's liberation. It is Bangladesh's independence without, of course, undermining the uh, spectacular role played by uh, both the Indian government and, uh, um, and and its armed forces. And, you know, with that, with that, may I may I take um, this question to you, General Obroi? Uh, you were a young major during the 1971 war um, and had just joined duty in the military operations directorate uh, when the war actually broke out. Uh, General Obroi, if you could uh, tell us your recollections of the uh, liberation of Bangladesh. Yeah, before uh, joining on the 4th of December, I was in the staff college doing the staff course uh, for one year. And during the whole progress of the course, it was becoming more and more evident that firstly, there would be war. And secondly, we will get a chance, which all soldiers want, to be in that war. And uh, as there are, there, are, there are a number of marks which we have to keep in mind. The day the Pakistani army, um, I, I would say, started their massacres in the whole of Bangladesh, convinced us that this war has to be fought and won. And thereafter, the second highlight was the unfortunate position which the Americans had taken. And at that time, General Westmoreland, who was the chief of the, of the US Army, had visited us in Staff College to give a talk. And uh, he was grilled thoroughly by all the students till the commandant had to come and put a stop to it. Because, you know, the, there was no reason which one could think of for the mm -hmm. For, for the American view which they had taken. Anyway, the point is that the course ended. Everybody moved. By that time, the mobilization had taken place. Uh, we were, in fact, some most of our units who were going to actually do the fighting and the formation were already in their war locations. We had been there. Skirmishes were going on. There was firing from both sides. Uh, there are a couple of points which need to be highlighted as far as the 1971 war is concerned. Firstly, it was different from the wars we had fought earlier. In 47-48 in Kashmir, in 1962 against China, in 1965 again in Pakistan, in various places in Kutch, in Kashmir and the whole of the border, we were on the defensive. India was reacting to what the Pakistanis did or what the Chinese China men did. But this was the first case which was coming to us where we were going to, we, we had the uh, initiative. initiative. And that was a different thing altogether. Now, there was a lot of preparations because 
our chief at that time, General Field Marshal later, Sam Manikshaw, managed to persuade the Prime Minister that the army needed time for various reasons, and the reasons were given, both weather-wise, both preparation-wise, before setting the stage and so on. And the Prime Minister agreed fully and left it to the army to carry on this. So that was the second part, which was very, very important. The third was that by the early December or late November, all plans of the Indian Army were fully made up. Logistics had been moved up, which were required. Because please remember that in none of the three previous wars, there was any operation against East Pakistan deliberately by India. We didn't want to open another front there for no reason. So that, that was the second thing. The third was that the weather was conducive to firstly the northern borders being closed and therefore we could spare some more forces for operations in the east. And the second part, which is also very important, is that we avoided the monsoons, which made the whole of Bangladesh with all its rivers and streams, etc., very difficult to operate, especially in a speedy advance. Uh, it also gave a lot of training to our boys, to our units. Not that they are not otherwise trained, but you need training specific yeah. to the task at that point of time. And secondly, the training of the Mukti Bahini, which played such a stellar role, both in assisting and gathering of intelligence and acting as scouts for our advances. This is very important. Unfortunately, at that point of time when we were there, we did not talk about the Mukti Bahini openly because of various political and diplomatic reasons, shall I say. But today, we can talk very, very easily. And they were, they helped quite, quite a bit. And one more point, which was very important, was that the personalities who were there in Delhi and, and, and at other places were working in sync together. We were not joined, even at, at that time. We were still not joined, unfortunately. But the coordination was so good. And I think the reason was because of the personal uh, personalities of the dramatic personae at I... that particular time, starting with the prime minister, with all the three chiefs, and also yeah. the civilian, the ministry, the trade, the railways, and so on. Uh, it, right. it, is, it, is, it is extremely good that one of the things in India which we are very proud of is that when difficulties arise, we forget all our other problems and join together. And that is what happened in 1971. Right. General Obroy, thank you. I mean, I'll come back to you uh, with more questions on the larger grand strategy at play here. But because uh, Ambassador Karim needs to go in a few minutes. Ambassador Karim, let me, I was wondering uh, if you could uh, tell us, um, you know, how is India's role in Bangladesh's liberation remembered in the popular imagination in, in Bangladesh? It's, it's a tale in which two countries and soldiers fought side by side and shed their... their, 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 their the birth of Bangladesh actually is, is, fer, is, how shall I say it, made fertile by the mingled blood of the martyrs from both sides. So in a sense, perhaps in history, it's a unique such tale. Uh, and, and so we do remember it uh, with a lot of uh, gratitude. Uh, and, and as Ambassador Das Gupta has very painstakingly and very methodically uh, shown us how all the different elements were in play, mm -hmm. not just in the political, uh, domestic uh, politics and anguishings and arguments, but also among players and between players, between uh, field and between center and everything. Uh, it, it brings together a lot, a lot of which I lived through. I missed some of it because from 69 
I, I went out of my first posting and my posting was to Tehran and that was still in the Pakistan mission. I was a junior third secretary then. But I was watching, I, well, in Tehran, I was more or less, I became a hostage after 71 broke out because they won't, I couldn't leave Tehran. That was, you know, I, I, I would either have to be flown back to Islamabad or stay there indefinitely until they allowed me to leave. And so we finally, uh, Ambassador Das Gupta and I have something in common. He arrived, I think, uh, less than two weeks or about two weeks before I did in Dhaka. I was finally allowed to leave Tehran in 21st or 22nd of March, and I arrived in Dhaka on the 23rd of March. Ironically, what was Pakistan's national day, or previous Pakistan's <laughs> national day? But in time right. for my first, in time for my first national day in independent Bangladesh, and so a lot of things that he talks about fits into a lot of things. I miss the action on the ground. I was seeing it from afar. I was seeing how relatives and friends were contriving to escape, taking an arduous tour, somehow managing to reach Karachi, from Karachi, going on to Quetta, from Quetta into Afghanistan, coming through the land route to Tehran and then going west. I helped some of them surreptitiously. It was difficult. So, you know, but we, when those horror stories coming started coming in, we realized the magnitude of whatever was happening that we could not imagine otherwise with a controlled media there. Uh, we heard, for instance, as we would hear stories because uh, Shah of Iran was trying to play a mediatory role. Uh, he was very much conscious of the effects that a secession of a unit of Pakistan would have on his own borders because Iran has Baluchistan which it shares with Pakistani Baluchistan. That's right. And this, That's of right. course, he shared That's this right. story with us several years later when I went back with the foreign, foreign minister to establish diplomatic ties between the state I had been posted in earlier as a Pakistan diplomat and now as a Bangladeshi diplomat. Uh, mm -hmm. So, August, I'm, I was told at that time, and many of the things that uh, uh, Ambassador Das Gupta has said, puts in context the rumors we were hearing. Ambassador, can you I know, I, I, I know I you just, need to leave, just, but just, one, one yeah, quick question for you. One no. minute. Just I, one more quick question, this actually. Train. Sure. Yeah, just let me finish this train. Sure. That, that there were attempts to try and restart a dialogue and a negotiation. And that they would, you know, Iran had offered its, its good offices as, a, uh, as an honest broker, so to say. But by August, the news that we got again filtered in through other sources was, no, the commanders in the field have said, we have already spent so much, shed so much blood. For what? We have crossed the point of no return. There is no going back to negotiations now. So, you know, all these things fell into place at that point. So, uh, no, right. Right. Now, the quick question that I wanted to ask Ambassador Karim is this. You were first a Pakistani diplomat and then you were a Bangladeshi diplomat. Um, how did how did that transition take place within your own sort of personality and within, within your own uh, uh, person, as it were? It was, uh, the transition was foregone. This was my home. Right. All right. Right. But, but I belong to a family... Uh, a civil, a bureaucratic family. My father was in the federal service. So my mm. parents and my five young siblings, only one was of college going stage. He was in the medical college. The others were all high school or primary or secondary school. They were all in Islamabad and they were virtually hostage there. I had no contact with my family. With I couldn't speak to my father until I think the month of June. And that also not directly. Uh, uh, finally, uh, I think my, my, I was lucky to have a very kind-hearted ambassador who was perhaps different because he was the nephew of King Amanullah of Afghanistan. So he was, he was a Pakistani of very Afghan Pathan descent. And, <laughs> and he had a different attitude towards the few handful of Bangladeshis there. And he sort of shielded us from the jibes and taunts and, you know, uh, the, the, the sort of attitude that set in, 
immediately after 25th March 71. And uh, he basically, it was he who put his neck on the line and said, I'm letting them go. Holding six more uh, uh, Bengalis hostage is not in our interest. And, and we will need friends one day. We'll let them go. But that was a fact of life. I didn't know even after I came back to Bangladesh when or how I would see my parents. It's another matter that they actually physically took the risk. They escaped in end of 1972, very harsh winter, crossed across the border. They literally trekked across the border in five, six feet of snow into Afghan territory. They were intercepted thrice by police check posts. And my father, I think, had a minor heart attack on the way of crossing because of the tension. So we paid a price in very different ways. He became a refugee in his own country the second time around because he had first come and he had become more or less come as a refugee in, in 1947. So uh, I wouldn't want my children to go through an experience like this or my grandchildren to face something like that. Uh, and when I look back, it is so tragic what we have done to ourselves. It is so very tragic. Uh, you talked about our economic success. Now, Bengal was for centuries, not just during the time of the Bengal presidency, for centuries known to international travelers from East and West as a storehouse, as a granary, as a, as a very rich place. And at the height of Mughal rule, it contributed 40% of global GDP. During the British presidency Raj, it had the highest GDP of all the three presidencies the British governed India through. It had the highest per capita GDP in a little town called Shillong. What happened to all of that? It was, it was basically after the partition and we partitioned our minds in the process. That is the whole problem. So, thank you. Uh, th thank, thank you, Ambassador Karim, and congratulations once again on the on, on, on the victory day. And if you stay back, we'd be happy, but I understand if you, if you need to leave. No, thank you. One final word in parting. Yeah. You know, uh, we could not have achieved this in nine months that we did without the overall help that we got from India. You know, the multidimensional help that we got political, strategic, geopolitical, diplomatic, military, you name it, everything was there. However, if India had not come to our assistance, if they had stayed back, because there were, there were different uh, arguments going on within India. I, I, yeah. I was told there was one famous remark attributed to Mrs. Gandhi, whether it's fact or fiction, I don't know, that she didn't want two, Bangla uh, two Pakistans on two sides. Okay, which which may have been one strand of the that you know they they could have other consequences, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, and that mm -hmm. is that is very true. Uh, after all, uh, we have minority majority issues in all of us. This is something which we have created yeah. for ourselves in the thirties, yeah. and it lingers. I see it being it it rearing its head once again, and it is affecting everybody. So in a sense, we are linked with each other by blood ties, not just in 71 when we shed blood with each other on the ground to hallow it. We are linked through millennia of intermingling and I have argued largely peaceful coexistence. And, and so we will continue reacting. Whatever happens in one will affect the other. Uh, so we, I think the way forward is to try and recapture what we lost. It will never be the same. Reinvent it, uh, uh, re-energize it, give it a new shape in the Westphalian paradigm, uh, the Westphalian world that we live in, but live in amity, in, in cooperation, in collaboration, uh, working on what unites us. There is far more that unites us than divides us. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank, thank you, Ambassador Kenny. Thank you so much. Uh, General Oberoi, you have actually written um, in one of your articles that uh, there was good co coordination between the three services, despite the lack of uh, formal joint structures. And after initial pressure on the military to act fast, the viewpoint of the military had prevailed. For a change, 
all or most ministries and departments of the government acted in sync and the entire nation rose to support the war effort. You, the point that you made uh, earlier as well, that there was a, um, you know, grand strategic coordination as it were. You know, a lot of people um, look at the Indian um, um, strategies and say India does not have a grand strategy as it were. Um, India does not think strategically enough. Do you think this was an exception? This was an exceptional moment when India thought together and, and sort of um, um, had a grand strategic approach to what needed to be done in, in East Pakistan? Yes, undoubtedly. You see, no military of any size can fight, plan and execute strategies unless there is an overall government's grand strategy. It is unfortunate that even today we don't have an articulated, well-articulated grand strategy. We are only involved in crisis and putting the smoke down. The point is that unless the strategy comes from the top in a democracy, it is the elected uh, elected uh, people who, who, who are the part of the government, who are the government, not bureaucrats. Bureaucrats are official. Just like the military, we fight on the borders or across the borders or wherever we are asked to do so, the job of the bureaucrats is to assist the our, our elected leaders, prime minister, the CCS and all the other ministries and so on to do so. Now, unless there is comprehensive employment with one aim in mind of everyone, not just the military, we will not be able to succeed. One reads about saying that in 71, we could do it. Why couldn't we do it today? Between in 50 years, a lot changes. And in fact, we have been wanting even before 1971. And when I say we, I am talking about the army. Otherwise, the we, we've always said that uh, it is jointness which will prevail. And what happened in 1971 is we came together and but unfortunately, we were only coordinating. And the reason for that is the personalities involved at that point of time. And uh, we, we went together tomorrow. It may not be so in the next war. It may not be so, especially when the war, war fighting has changed because of technology, because of all kinds of different wars, hybrid wars and shadowy wars and so on, which have prevailed, we become nuclear powers. We, today, India is a nuclear power. Both our adversaries today are also <laughs> nuclear powers. Now that makes a lot of difference. You can't fight by the army and navy and air force fighting alone all the time. So therefore, I'm glad you raised this point about jointness. And uh, I would like to tell everybody that today, jointness is much, much more important than what it was required in earlier times, where coordination could help, but good coordination. For example, only six years before that, in 1965, we did not have a good coordination. So it is a good, because the personalities were different, the people were different, the fighting was different, and so on. And especially when we have to go on the offensive, when we have to advance, when we have the initiative, jointness is extremely important. And I'm glad that we are going in for theater commands so that all, all the services are together. And in fact, I want to go beyond it and say that what we need is comprehensive jointness, mm -hmm. that is, all the ministries who are involved, after all, in any endeavor, and especially in a war situation, the diplomats, the finance, the railways, the, the, the urban, the, uh, uh, the population, in fact, the whole population is involved in that. So therefore, what we need is comprehensive power, like the right. Chinese. Right. And right. it is... It is it, the, the correct thing is that comprehensive power does not mean that it is against democracy. No, 
democracy is actually more suited for comprehensive power than a dictatorship, whether it's a theocratic di dictatorship or a ideological dictatorship. That's a different issue altogether. So yeah. I, 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 I must. Uh, I'm glad you raised this point because this is an important yeah. and must spread that we must go soonest, but not in a hurry. Soonest, right? In, right. In, and right. retaining our balance into theater commands so that we worked it out. We, we should not right. keep talking about it. Right. General Obroy, um, you know, a lot has been written, um, a lot of books have been written about it, articles have been written about it, about the essential elements and goals of India's military strategy in 1971. But as, a, as an officer on the ground who participated in the operations, what are your um, you know impressions or recollections about um, how the military strategy sort of coordinated with the political, humanitarian, and diplomatic components, as it were. Uh, any recollections that, that you could share would be of, uh, of great use. We were uh, extremely lucky in 1971 because we had a very strong prime minister in Mrs. Mm. Indra Gandhi. Also, she had very valuable and experienced civil officials under her and at the same time the military all the three services were headed by excellent admirals and generals and air marshals so this helped a great deal but the requirement is that we need military strategy falls from national strategy if mm -hmm. the military strategy is there it cannot be in a vacuum after all, right. the nation must tell you, what do you want? What does the nation want? And the military is the executor to get that particular thing. Therefore, importance is that we must have a grand strategy. And if people think that we are, uh, that if, if people think that grand strategy is not uh, required or should not be open to the public, then I think there is something wrong. Democracies may have certain secret things which can be a separate part of a grand <laughs> strategy known to only those people who work on that. But without a military, without a national strategy, the military strategy will not fall in place because military strategy is linked again to diplomatic strategy, to economic strategy, to commercial right. strategy, and, and right. political, and so on. So therefore, that is important. And what the nation felt at the end of the war was exuberance that our military had done so. A greatest victory. 93,000 prisoners were taken which has never happened, not even in the Second World War, in any particular campaign, and so on. And yet, at the end of it, we lost it on the political table. Now, and we are still struggling with it. So the Do point... You, uh, is, is it your argument, General Obroy, that um, in Shimla we should have negotiated for more? Is that the argument you're making? Of course, of course. Here was a chance. What is See, after all, what does the military... What does the nation expect from the military? The nation expects that the military should be victorious in what they do so that the political process can then start for mm. the end is with the politicians, with the leadership of the nation. The end is not with the military. The military creates the base, creates how, the, how to achieve it. We do it. We did a very good job, the military and assisted by the Bang Mukti Bahini and others from the Bangladesh. We did an excellent job, a job which had not been done earlier for ages. And yet, when we, were, we didn't know, know or we didn't show what the political end state was. After all, Clausewitz had said, war is what? <clears throat> Politics by other means. So the end state is always political, never military. The military has to be good. The military has to be excellent. 
the military has to win battles, win wars, and give it on a platter. So, so what is it that India should have, General? What is it that India should have pressed for in Shimla during the political diplomatic negotiations? A lot of things. After all, the Kashmir problem, which still exists, which existed at that time and which has been existing right from 1947. And we've been making, all we've done is make blunders at the political level, right right from 47. <laughs> surely, hmm. surely we don't want to do that. If the, armed, if the armed forces have won the victory for you, we've got, we had in our hand 93,000 prisoners. No leader of Pakistan could have held on unless these 93,000 prisoners were gone, had gone back. Because, and that is, we let it go. We just let it go. I don't know why. There are many speculations. I can also speculate, but that's not the point. The point right. is that the, the leadership, the political leadership must know, must articulate, must take into confidence what the end state they want from the military. And the military will produce it. The Indian military will produce it for them. Right, sir. sir one, one final question uh, before we wind up, and that is, you know, what, what in your opinion has been the impact of the 1971 war, the preparations, the victory on the Indian armed forces uh, itself? Um, you think we were, as, 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 as you, you returned as the vice chief of the Indian army, um, uh, do you think it had an impact on how the military uh, planned or behaved thereafter uh, since 1971? Yes, certainly. Unfortunately, in between, what has happened is that the army especially, and also the Air Force to some extent, and a little to do with the Navy, has been sucked into counterinsurgency operations. This is not the job of the army. This is not the job well, of the military. Well, we are sir. doing so because the armed, because the police, including the armed police, both the central and the state, are not fit enough or are not well led or not well trained to do so. Now, this has impacted adversely on the ability of the armed forces to modernize at one, one end and secondly, to face the future wars which are upon us and the future wars are not going to be the 71 war or the 65 war or the 62 war but it will be a whole new concept of war and unless we are free to plan to organize structure or restructure and train for this new war we will not succeed so my parting line is that we must get away, we must move out of counterinsurgency operation. It is hurting us. But there are individuals who, within the army also, within the armed forces also, who think wrongly, in my opinion, that the counterinsurgency operations somehow help us. No, they don't help us. We would well, much well. Uh, absolutely. I think that's that's a fantastic argument. I completely agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more on that. Um, and, and the army should be busy with uh, preparing for future wars. And the future wars are going to be, as you correctly pointed out, of a different kind altogether. So they cannot be bogged down uh, by domestic insurgencies and fighting those insurgencies. Well, absolutely well said. And also, uh, so many, so many fascinating insights. Thank you so much, uh, General Broy, for joining us this evening. Uh, Unfortunately, Ambassador Das Gupta couldn't join, but uh, um, once again, congratulations on the, to the Indian Armed Forces and uh, to the uh, uh, friends, friends in Bangladesh on the Victory Day. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Thank you. Thank you very much.